Hello. My contention is that to be able to understand our own dreams and the wisdom to pay close attention to what we're dreaming is just as important to education today as science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Notice that I don't say just as important as creativity. The longer I've worked with dreams, the more impossible it is for me to separate dreams from creativity. The dreams we dream at night are raw specimens of the creative mind we all have the moment the uncreative part of us goes to sleep and we start to dream. What, what gives rise to our dreams and our creativity is the same thing that gives rise to our enlightenment, our truthfulness, our authenticity, um, any number of things like that, the real, real deeper values in, in being a human being. And so I would, for today, I would redefine creativity, not just as the ability to discover ourselves and invent new things, but as the ability to innovate and gain self-knowledge in ways that produce a better world, a fairer world, an Earth that's more sustainable, a planet that'll be good for our children and not just for us. When we look at the dream we wake up with in the morning, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't seem logical. This is because dreams arise from a part of ourselves that is so superior to us and knows so much more. We don't understand its language. Our dreams, our own dreams, speak the language of Jesus, Buddha, Shakespeare, Einstein. The pictures in our dreams are metaphors. The metaphor is the language of our creative mastery. What's happened in these recent times if, is that we've turned our back on that. And when we do that, we fall into the service of that cunning rogue, the emissary. Yes, the Nietzsche's master emissary paradigm that has been made famous by Ian McGilchrist to explain the relationship between the left and right hemisphere of the divided brain, it fits perfectly. The relationship between our waking mind and our dreams. The mind we have when we dream is far superior to the mind we have when we're awake. But what we do today is we focus on the small mind and turn our back on the larger one. The perspective of the two minds is different. The dream looks at reality like the little child in Hans Christian Andersen's tale, The Emperor's New Clothes. He sees the, the naked emperor strutting down the street. Our waking mind looks at reality like all the other people along the street in that story. They're all talking about how beautiful the emperor's garments are. We, when we're awake, are not quite so honest. Our dreams are perfectly honest. I want to give an example of this from my own life. I, when I was in my 30s, I was a scientist, but I was far more interested more and more in reading, reading novels, reading books, and it occurred to me I might write a novel. And so I, I didn't want to spend my life doing something that had begun to bore me, begun to make me feel like I was a sterile person, so 
I cashed, I, I left my career and I, I, I cashed in on my, the money, I took my money, and I, I tried to write a novel. <laughs> what I discovered is that I didn't have any creativity. <laughs> and if I wrote a sentence, that my sentences had no feeling. I couldn't write a sentence with feeling. Well, I figured everybody has to have feeling, everybody has to have creativity, so I, and I've been reading a bunch of books, and some of them were books about dreams, so I thought, well, I'm going to write down my dreams, I'll work with my dreams, i analyze my dreams, and I'll see what the deal is. So I bought more books on dreams, I, I wrote down my dreams every morning, I went to my other room, sat at the desk, and analyzed them morning after morning after morning. I could never make any sense of them. <laughs> They're very complicated. Then I got a hold of a book that talked about the dream series. I'd never heard about that. A dream series is a dream, a long series of dreams, where it's like a, a TV serial, you know, where you have the individual episodes, or a long novel like War and Peace with many little chapters. And so each dream is only one chapter and carries the sto story forward a little bit. So I thought, well, this is it. I'm going to go through my journals and catalog them, and I'll find... I'll find a dream series, and if, then if I start analyzing one part of the dream, I'll understand the other part. This will work for me. And so I did that, and I found, I came up with a dream series with 60-some 60, 60 repetitions. The same dream came back 60-some times. Now, the, th the funny thing is that I didn't notice it. I didn't notice that the same dream kept coming back. I'd write it down, and I'd go to my desk, and I'd analyze my dreams, and I'd never analyze that dream. Now, the only thing I could figure, well, why would I analyze a dream like that? In the dream, every single dream. I, I was back at my father's house in Miami, Florida. My father arrived, and I was in a hurry to get out of there. And so, to me, why would, what's there to understand? I mean, it's right, the meaning's right on the surface. I, the last place in the world I would want to go is my father's place in Miami. I never wanted to go back there. After high school, I ran away from home, caught a bus up north, for 17 years, I never had any contact with him, never returned. I hated the man. So then I wondered, well, why am I having this dream? Why does the dream keep putting me back there? So I started working with a dream, and the way you work with a dream, you get an image and you associate to it, and you associate to the association till you, you hit upon something that happened in real life. And then you line up all these episodes, and this is the narrative. This is the narrative of me. This is why, what my father did to me, why I hated him, the same old story I knew. But then I found an image that didn't go in that direction. It went in a different direction. It sort of made me uneasy. So I went to a different part of the dream, and I found another image like that. It made me even more uneasy. And all of a sudden, at that moment, I knew what the dream meant. And there was a shriek cutting through the night, and it came out of me. My chest was heaving. I was a scientist, I was never an emotional person, and I started sobbing. I had mistaken hurt for hate. My father had hurt me, but I loved him and I forgave him. Within a week, I was on an airplane down to Miami. I went to my father's place. We had a reconciliation. It was wonderful for him, it was wonderful for me. When I came back to New York, I figured now I have somewhere to go home to for Christmas. Two weeks later, I got a phone call in the middle of the night. My father had had a heart attack. He was dead. How does a dream know? A dream no, and keep coming back over 60 times. Go to Miami, go to Miami. <laughs> and I'm so stupid in the dream, so smart. Well, I got very interested, and I, more interested than in writing, and I opened up my apartment one night a week to what I call the free dream community. People would assemble from all over New York and that area, and we'd work with dreams. After, after doing this some weeks or months, we all realized this is very important, this is very important, what's happening here? So we started putting out a newsletter to promote the spread of these dream communities all, all over the world. We sent newsletters all over the United States, all across the world. And uh, another dream community started up in New Jersey, another one in Brooklyn, and people were starting to talk about a dream, a dream movement. There was a dream movement happening. And then it went in a direction that I, that I didn't like. It wasn't a direction that I wanted to go in. And so brokenhearted, I sort of dropped away and I became isolated. And Montague Allman, 
I became isolated, but not before I had attracted the attention of Montague Allman. And he came down to my apartment, and he took me out to lunch, and he said, Bill, you were right. What you tried to do was right. And he wanted me to start again and do this work. I said, no way. I didn't want to... I, I'd had enough of trying to change the world. And um, so he invited me up to his uh, training session. He had a training session for a, a, a group. He developed a group approach to dreams that ordinary people could use. People who, like me, who had no background in psychology whatsoever. And it was a very simple, simple process. It was fun. And he, I went up to his leadership training workshop, and um, he kept inviting me for some 25 years. I kept going up there. I think I was the longest person that, that went to those. And um, he always wanted me to start up my grassroots work again. I didn't want to. Then my wife got an academic position in Taiwan. We came here, I followed her, and thanks to her help, we established the Allman Dream Group as a course at the university here. And we started training other university professors on how to do this course themselves. You don't have to be an expert to do this. Anyone can do this. It's a creative approach. Now, you might ask, well, what can you learn from dreams? Because, at least in the way I teach the course, there, 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 are, there are no quizzes, there are no exams, there's no final exam. I have no reading assignments, I assign no papers. Everything the students learn, they learn from their own dreams. So what can you learn from dreams? Well, it turns out, what you can learn from dreams is probably what's most important to know today. Now, the standard idea of dreams is that we, we have this, like, there's a little tiny, little ti a little ti the conscious mind is like a little tiny spotlight on the stage. The unconscious mind is vast. It's not just the whole stage, maybe the whole campus. It's really huge. And it, it uh, sees things we don't even see all the time, and it assembles these, and it brings them forward, producing dreams, always has new insights. We're relatively stupid. It knows a lot. Montague Oman went further than that. He found, from a lifetime of working with thousands and thousands of people's dreams, he found that every dream that someone really figured out, it seemed that they had touched down into a part of themselves, was so pure, so true, so unpolluted, that he called it our incorruptible core of being. Now, recently, a neuroscientist who uh, studies uh, Buddhist meditation has um, and also practices Buddhist meditation, has come up with a, a, a term, um, our basic human goodness. I think these are about the same thing. In fact, the idea is as old as culture itself. From ancient Egypt, to ancient India, to ancient Tibet, to ancient China, to Japan, all across the East, the lotus flower is a metaphor for the sacred, aspect of the human mind. You always see the Buddha sitting on a lotus flower. The lotus flower comes up, through the, it grows in a dirty pond, stinky, polluted water, yucky. And the lotus flower grows up through that with its bud, and then comes above the water, then it opens the flower, and the flower is perfectly pure. There's not a speck of dirt or mud. It's perfectly pure and beautiful. That's the metaphor in these Eastern religions for the enlightened mind. What Montague Allman's approach to dreams does, it is enables ordinary people to, to touch in to that aspect of themselves. If we're going to make a world that works, that's not sort of burning itself out, flooding all the cities, et cetera, et cetera, we need to touch in to that part of ourselves so that what we do is not more destructive than constructive. A student came in with a dream. She was a murderer. As soon as we started working with a dream, it turned out that her passion was journalism. She wanted to tell the truth about Taiwan. Of course, her parents and her friends said, journalism, you can't make any money doing that. Go for business. So she changed, and she went into business. All of a sudden, she lost all her interest in learning 
and studying. She just stayed in bed. The dream told her the person she'd murdered was herself, her real self. She went back into journalism. <laughs> the, um, this idea of the incorruptible core of being, or of, of, of neuros, of this idea of, um, of the lotus flower, these are sort of flowery ideas, and it's not the kind of idea a neuroscientist would accept. But I think there's a way to explain it that a neuroscientist would understand. Neuroscience used to believe the brain was hardwired, so the, if you have damage because of a car accident or a stroke, that's it, you're finished. You have a paralyzed part all your life. But certain neuroscientists developed these apparatuses and procedures that found there's a, there's, there often is a part in the brain that's not damaged. If they could just... And the, it's the signals of that part are being, being flooded out by the damaged part, all the noise. If they could just em emphasize increase the signal and the, and the undamaged part, then the brain could use the healthy part as a, as a portal of entry and get information into the brain. Once the brain can take in the true information, it will start, it will start doing the right thing, and actually they could make people move their arm again. Montague Allman's process with dreams is exactly the same. What the dream does is it brings up part of us that hasn't been corrupted by the world, that hasn't been ruined by betrayal or a bad experience or this or that. And so this can change the person all of a sudden. The person connects with this incorruptible core of being, this pure part that works, and everything takes care of itself. The problems iron out. And this is the way the group process with dreams actually work. And if you ask then, well, what is it then that dreams, dreams have that we need today? Well, what it is, is that they can find the part of us that's most vibrantly alive and true, and they can bring this forward so that we can use it to change our life and the way we do our work. Thank you very much.